I just want to thank all the people they were talking about that serve at our church. There's just so much, you know, I think back at all the different things that happen uh, every Sunday to make this service happen. You know, we've got people in the nursery. We've got people in the big kids area. We've got people in the P-zone with the little guys. We've got youth people. We've got people that usher and people that greet and people that uh, set up for us to have a nice little snack before we start and have the coffee. Somebody picks up the coffee. Um, they run all the equipment that you saw on screen. Um, they make sure those cards are on your seats. So there's lots of things that take place. And I just think, um, we have all those people, a round of applause. And we thank you guys. It's really awesome. It's just been, um, it's been a great month to see the different things on Facebook and seeing the people that serve. And the smile on their face is real. It's true. It's authentic. It's not, they weren't putting on that face for the camera. Because I know everybody that's up there. And I know it's real. And they have a heart to serve, and they love their God, and they just want to make sure that everybody else is uh, here to enjoy the aspect of who God is. Um, it was funny because uh, this morning, I guess we were a little short because I wasn't working back there much this morning. I was getting ready for here. And all of a sudden, it's like Monica comes escorting Gary Little into, into the kids' church, comes plowing through us and goes, hey, I got a volunteer. I'm like thinking, wow, she's going to captivate him and get him in that room before he can turn around and walk away and say no. And then, get, it, it just, it was funny because he got to work with the little guys. So it was kind of like, all right, cool, this is great. Not only is Gary Little coming in, a big tall dude, to work with the kids, but he's working with the two and three year olds. So it was awesome. So thank you, Gary, for serving. Hope you come out alive. So hopefully you see this. All right, so this morning, now that you're with me, hopefully uh, you'll hear where I'm coming from with this. Uh, today I wanted to talk about motivational speakers. I know life is full of motivational speakers, even if you don't know one by name. I'm sure you see people on TV and on the radio uh, trying to motivate you um, with the inspirational stories and the different things that come up. And I was thinking the only thing that came to mind and there's a couple of speakers uh, that came to mind right off the bat was uh, Tony Robbins is one. And another one, didn't even really think about it, but then I thought back to the old days. And uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a, is a motivational speaker into health and stuff like that. And the first thing that came to mind is what are motivational speakers here to do? We're here to pump you up, right? So you guys remember that? Hopefully you're with me today because there's going to be lots of little tags here and there. And I want to make sure everybody gets it. So, if you've ever seen Arnold Schwarzenegger on SNL, has a skit where he's talking about pumping you up. And I think we've run into that uh, on a daily basis and we don't even realize it. And sometimes we get sucked in before we realize what had just happened to us. Because we end up taking what they have to say and offer. And I hate to say it, but it has nothing to do with Christ. It has nothing to do with the cross. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with the only one that is able to motivate us, and to inspire us, and to cause our lives to change. So these guys come on and they try to change our lives by inspiring us, telling us inspirational stories. They come on and they try to get at our heartstrings and also to build us up and tell us how great we are and to convince ourselves of that. If you've seen recently, there's a Geico commercial with Pinocchio as the new motivational speaker. And as soon as he gets in front, on you and you. And the nose is out to hear. He doesn't even believe what he's saying. So it's just, it's kind of a joke that these guys come in and they cha try to change our lives and they get paid for it and they get paid quite well. So, but the problem with that is it regulates growth to the outer man and it ignores the inner man because the inner man is what matters. The inner man is what's eternal. The outside will fall away, but we want the increase of Christ in our lives. So today as I'm talking, I want you to see that we need more Christ in our life. We need more of whatever it is He has to offer that's personal to us that will change our lives. Let's pray. Father, we just thank You for today. I thank You for all those people that serve at Oasis. We just appreciate their dedication, their hard work, and their service of love towards us. And Father, I just pray today as our ears are open that our hearts would hear and our minds would take and transform everything into who You are that our lives might be made new. In Jesus' name, amen. So they come to share all of our little tidbits with us and to get us to 
be inspired enough to make a change. Uh, 2 Peter 2, 1 to 3 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. There it is, fabricated stories. I don't know about you, but in the past I found out some people weren't exactly what they said they were in the, back, in the, in the past. Think of Millie Vanilli. Comes out that they weren't even singing. You know? So how many times have we been fooled by people who think that we, they have our best interests at heart when really it's only about their pockets? It's only about sounding good and tweaking our ear enough for us to buy into what they're trying to sell us, which is a bill of goods. But it's been around forever, as we heard in Second Peter. So nowadays we still have all these self-help books, and they line the shelves of bookstores, not just Barnes & Noble, but the Christian stores too. And we're advised to look at ourselves for improvement. So what we do is we talk ourselves into the fact that we can encourage ourselves to reach a level of happiness that we desire. I don't know about you, but looking in the mirror has never done that for me. It usually creates sadness and, oh God, look at my hair today. Oh my gosh, my makeup's not going on correctly. Wow, this is not working out. My eyes are swollen. You know, just different things. Oh, my beard's not straight. I cut it wrong. I don't remember the mirror bringing back a reflection that says, you are awesome and you're going to have a great day. So we fail ourselves. And then we ask where God is. But yet we've banked on ourselves this whole time, and then we blame God that He's not there when we fail ourselves. So we wallow in self-pity. Psalms 118.8 says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. Wow, is that so true or what? Humans are going to fail us. I don't care who you are. There's going to be times in people's lives where they're just not going to come through for you. But there are going to be those that their desire is to come through for you. And 99% of the time they do, but that one time they have a bad day, we kind of look at that and go, man, they just threw me to the curb. But it's not true because they were trying and they're doing their best. And sometimes we get into those situations, but we need to take our refuge in the Lord. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. How much bigger does that help get than the maker of heaven and earth? I don't know about you, but I've seen people constructing things that I thought, wow, for somebody to architecturally design that building and place those items where they were placed, and for that thing to stand, and not only stand for the moment, but throughout time, for what its purpose was, even through earthquakes and wind and everything that might attack it, somebody had the thought in mind of how that design was to happen. Now, I look back and I look at how great that building is. We're talking about the creator of the universe how well that works together, how well everything fits. I, I talk to my kids at school, and it's like the Earth's rotation and the gravity is just enough to keep it away from one planet and also to keep it in a track around the sun. Imagine if that gravity was off just a little bit. We wouldn't have the effect we have today. So it's just, that's the creator of heaven and Earth. And he's the one that will help us. So we get sucked into the culture. We have a lot of culture around us, don't we? We hear that word a lot. The culture is basically what's happening around us. What's the trend and what are people doing? What are they following? Where are we going? Are we setting a difference in that or are we following what they're doing? And then we succumb to feel-good happiness. This offered through motivational speakers and self-help. Are we fashioning our lives after the tall tales that aren't aligned with the Word of God? I've heard so many people just say things that were like, wow, did this person even read what the Word of God says? Did he find out that not everything is happy and go lucky and feel good? There's suffering and there's trials, and those are those things that refine us and make us who we are because we're looking for those challenges in life. I don't know if you guys, but if you're just sitting home every day doing nothing, life is kind of meaningless. There's challenges out there. There's things to do. But it's not the motivational speaker that's going to get off our rear ends and get us out there to do things. It's God and God alone. It's that motivation of Christ in our lives, that salvation from the cross that says, I'm here to deliver you from your sins and to save you for heaven. Sometimes we just look at salvation as, I'm going to heaven. But salvation is, you saved me from myself, from my sins, from who I was 
into what I need to be. So we get stuck, we get trapped, we think we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. I don't know about you, but I've been through some of that lately, and I'm like, um, I can't do it. I've tried. I, I, I just, I got to let it go, and I just got to say, you know what, God, you're greater than this, you're bigger than this, and on your own strength works for some time, but if you've ever found out, it will die off at some point because you're mortal, and we, ha- we don't have an infinite amount to keep us going. We have a finite amount that stops us. So it's the type of motivation that inspires us, and we build on sinking sand. It's nowhere near a permanent fix. Ultimately, it's built on us. And here's us, an imperfect, sinful-natured man, blinded, perverse, and corrupt. Now, I laugh because, sorry if you guys are not into Saturday Night Live, but that's what came through when I was putting this message together. I couldn't let it go. So if you guys have ever seen Saturday Night Live, some time ago there was a character called Stuart Smalley. And if you see him up there, he was the man who'd sit in front of the mirror and try to convince himself of who he was. And his line was, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Now, I don't know about you, but that won't take me very far. Because I know there's some people that don't like me. I can guarantee it. But the first thing I have to question is, if somebody's telling me that, I have to look at the Word of God. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. If that doesn't work, we go with what Jesus said in Mark 10.18. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except for God alone. So, first we set ourselves up that we are good enough to inspire ourselves and motivate ourselves. We have the goods within us to propel us towards greatness. We have the goods within us to stand up to a trial or a temptation or a suffering. We have the goods within us to put on that happy face and make it seem real when it's not. It's all about us. But even Christ said, I am not even good. My Father is the only one that's good enough. So unless you're putting yourself in comparison to God, we have no business motivating ourselves and telling us how good we are, how great we are, because it's all about Him. And once we shut Him out of the picture, I believe that we've done ourselves an injustice and we've actually sentenced ourselves to death. Because without Christ, we all know what the end outcome is. So sin, anger, hatred, lust, apathy, complacency, pride, stubbornness, selfishness, the things of this world that you repeatedly turn to when rough times come. There's no answer but Christ. And that list could go on and on and on. And we're having a tough time. Where's the first place we go? I hate to say it, but most of the time it's not the Word of God. It's not prayer. It's back into the things that we were in the habit of doing as our old nature. Because it was comfortable, it was pleasing, and it brought us peace because we knew where we were. When you venture into finding out who Christ really is, You spend time in prayer or you go to your word when those times hit. You're just not sure what to expect, what he's going to ask, the changes he wants in you. And your response will be, I don't know. I think sometimes because of our unsure of our response, we don't venture there. So here's a couple of real good examples that might hit home because I see this all the time. I'm tired this week. I've had a rough week. There's lots going on. I worked really hard. It'll be okay to skip church and pull the blankets up over my head. But in the Word of God, it says to be here, to encourage one another, to uplift one another, to celebrate. Some of us look and always say, like, I need Sundays. i got to be there. I need the worship. I need the Word to make it through the week. But you have people that make those excuses that it's okay. So again, we turn to our need, not what God has asked it to do. So then it becomes more about us again instead of about God. Here's another one. Hopefully it doesn't hurt too bad. How about tithing? How many times have we come short that month? We know it's going to be squeaky. We know it's going to be tight. We're going to be pinching that purse or that penny and going, hmm, and go cut back. Again, we turn to us and who we are in our needs, in our old nature, instead of trusting in God and calling him more of him. Because that might be your area of need. Sometimes... We might not need to call on Christ to give us more in every area. Maybe it's just that one struggle we're still going through that we're saying, God, I just can't get over this. Every time this happens, I go do this. Why do I keep turning that direction? Well, that's the area that God wants you to leave alone. 
That's the area that God wants to cleanse. That's the area that we're still holding on to because we like it. We like it. Why do we keep repeating things? Because we like it. Why do you go to the same restaurant every Sunday? Because you like it. Nobody's forcing you. You don't go there going, oh God, we got to go here. No, you chose that place because you like it. You did this sin. You could, did this act because you like it. And that's the, only, that's the bottom line. We have no excuse to turn to to say, I don't know why I did that. Yes, you do. You did that because it's comfortable, it's peaceful, it's well known, and that's the habit you've created when this type of situation comes along. You've got a trigger and there it is. But who's the one that can take care of that trigger? His name is Christ. Oftentimes we take it on ourselves to conquer these issues, constantly relying on our own knowledge and strength, but as the Borg say, it's futile. Peter said in 2 Peter 2.22, of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit. Yuck. And a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. You ever wash your dog? What does your dog want to do as soon as you're done washing it? Head out in the yard and roll in the dirt. Just because it's comfortable, it feels good. Same thing. We wallow in the mud after we were just washed because that's what's comfortable and that's what feels good. Sounds gross to think about a dog returning to its vomit, but if you're familiar with dogs, they do clean up after themselves in that area. Sorry. Just honesty. Think about it. That's what we do. When we return to the things that we said we did not want anything else to do with and ask Christ to forgive us of and to make a 180 and turn around and start doing something else, we go right back to it. We're in that frame of mind. We have counted on everything else inside of us and on the outside to motivate us not to, but we've not called on Christ because that's the one area we want to hang on to to say, I've got a comfort zone to go to when I need to. Kind of sad. It's like always having a back door. You always leave something available just in case something doesn't work out. Hey, honey, I've got to go with these people to dinner tonight. Can you kind of call me at 8.30 and say something and we'll just play it off. You need me home because of the kids. You've always got an option. You've got a back door, a way out. I'm telling us today, let's shut the back doors. We have no choice but to shut the back doors unless we want to keep living the patterns we're living. So, we can't get out of the vicious cycle until we realize we need more of Christ. A life of hope. I don't know how many times I've come up with that word lately. It's just been incredible. Just Every time I see something going on, I was like, that person lacks any hope. They have nothing to turn to. It's like, so what's the difference between me and that other guy walking down the street? I have hope in this situation, even though we're both going through the same thing. I have hope in Christ that because of his salvation, and I know he's going to return, that I can live a life toward that. That I know it's coming, it's a promise, so I fashion my life after that, and I propel towards that direction. I didn't need anybody or motivational speaker to tell me that. God has told me that, the Word has told me that, and that's all I need to know exactly where I'm heading. So determine today that you're going to turn from that which holds you captive and put your hope in him. Decide that today that uh, self-reliance and motivational speakers are just going to continue us down the same destructive pattern. So, decide today that you will take every step necessary to break from popular opinion. Ruffle some feathers. Get a little crazy about it. God wants you to seek more of Him. Declare the more you want of Him to do and help you with your life. And it's not popular. And others are going to think you might be foolish, but that's what's required sometime to get more of him and less of you. So here's an example of someone believing more is better. Cross your fingers.
More cowbell. Sometimes that's what we need, more cowbell. We need more Christ. Let me give you a little background. It says, according to Ashbury Park, New Jersey Press in 2000, this is the band talking, the song features a prominent use of the cowbell percussion instrument. The song was originally recorded without a cowbell, but the sound was overdubbed into the song at a later stage. Bassist Joe Bouchard remembered a producer requesting his brother, drummer Albert Bouchard, to play the cowbell on the track. Joe Bouchard recalled, Albert thought he was crazy, but he put all this tape around a cowbell and played it anyway. It really pulled the track together. Could it be that more of Christ will bring it together for you? So what more will it take for you? More cowbell? More of something else? More prayer? More word? More thought about who he is? So, we need to live in a way of obedience to Christ. And that is steady persistence, adhering to a course of action, a belief or a purpose. It's called steadfastness. And I know because we're not steadfast sometimes. We're kind of wishy-washy. We're trying to get there. But if we have the genuine hope, it's not passive. We're not sitting around wishing and wanting and whining and wallowing. I've seen that way too many times. We're just defeated constantly. That's because we haven't found out where we need more of Christ in our life. Let's break down Psalms 139. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, behind, and before. And you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. So notice there, he didn't need a motivational speaker, speaker to talk to him about his life. He knows exactly who God is in his life. He announces that, God, you've searched me, you know me. So that tells us we are known and cared for. Because I think sometimes that's our defeat right there, is we don't think God's there at the moment and caring about us. We're not alone in our joys or our pains. He surrounds us. He knows our thoughts and our reactions. His presence as we move about our daily lives is as we live, move, and breathe. He assures us we are not up against this world on our own. He protects and motivates. And that's the thing right there. At the same time, it's so overwhelmingly wonderful that you can't even fathom the care that He has for us. We always feel we're in it alone. We always have that comment, God's not there for me. But it's not true. It says in Psalms 139, the psalmist knew he was there. He said, search my heart. I got it. I know. He also said, you know my tongue before I even say a word. That could be in anger or it could be in love. But God knows your response. You're not going to hide it from him. Like, wait a minute here, God. Hang on. I've got to go over here and get mad and cuss and scream and get upset. I'll be back. He's like, really? Come on. Are you serious? I don't know all that. I don't know your response. I don't know what's in your heart that's going to come from your mouth. Wrong. So he already knows us. So we have to come to a grip with ourselves that he already knows. Just the fact that we don't know that he knows. We try to convince ourselves otherwise. 139.7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Praise God, we can't hide from him. The darkness becomes light. He has that big of an effect. Have you ever had that effect on anything? Have you really turned on the lights in the darkness when you enter a room? Not likely. We might hear the cliche about it, but have we done that? No, only he has. So again, that inspiration that spurs us to say, I can do this, or I'm great enough, I'm good enough, is a bunch of bunk. Because we're not. There's no one good enough but him. We can't escape his presence. While we think we have control over the comings and goings of our lives, while we try to convince ourselves that we have the strength within ourselves to overcome any situation, guess what? Our abilities pale and are so minuscule in light of His great presence. If you put yourself up against God, how do we look? 
But yet we sit there and try to convince ourselves of how good we are and great we are and inspire ourselves to get through the day or inspire ourselves to do something beyond our capabilities. We spur ourselves towards good works to say, I made it in the world. Look at me. I've struggled and strived for this, and I made it. And who made me get there? Me. How does that honor God? Verse 13, For you created my inmost being. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand when I awake. I am still with you. The goal should be to please God. It's all about Him. He far outweighs any type of motivation that we can receive from anybody else because of His awesomeness. We can conjure up no thought of ourselves that will propel us toward purity, toward relief from a situation, or toward a sense of joy that drives away the darkness that God Himself hasn't or isn't able to exceed. So however great you think you are, however much you build yourself up inside, God still exceeds that. Think about it. You're fighting a losing battle. You're trying to build yourself up to handle everything against yourself, but God is still bigger than that no matter how big you've made it. So I look at that and go, oh my gosh, how can I even compete with a God who made me and knew me and put my life in His book before I would even take my first breath? I can't beat that. But yet on an everyday basis, some people try to because they need encouragement. But encouragement comes from God. So let me ask you a couple more questions here. Do we have the guts to say, as the psalmist said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Wow, what a thought that I could stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and be able to say that. Check me out. Look, here, here's my heart. Know my motives. Know what I want. See inside of me and search me to know that I am not about that anymore. I am about following after you and doing whatever needs to be done to make that happen. Imagine you being able to do that. It's hard to do sometimes because we have that time where we just want to go back to what we used to do to get through a situation or when we're tempted and we return to that. But he said, here it is. Check it out. Search me. Know that my ways are true and honest and I will not fear that you're going to condemn me because I know I'm following you. So, we need to go against the flow, as you saw with Bruce Dickinson. Everybody thought that cowbell was nuts. Everybody said that sound ruined it. But what did he do? He came in and said, more cowbell. And you're going, oh my gosh, it was already overriding the song. But in him, the man who said, I make gold records, said, it needs more cowbell. So what do you do? Put in more cowbell. So what does God require of you that you need more in your life to be able to do the same? So, when's the last time you made a conscious, verbal, or physical choice to stand against the thinking of this world and proclaim the way the psalmist did that God is in love with you and He has your best interests at heart? That Psalm 139 does not tell me He's looking to condemn me. He's not after me. He's not chasing me down. He's already everywhere. So wherever I go, He is. Whatever He set in motion is to be, and I need to follow after Him. So, begin to think differently. Determine that you're going to look at things differently through the eyes of Christ. So, let's see this. What is the prescription for change? So what is it for you? Yeah, so what's the prescription for you today? You know what it is. You don't need anybody to tell you. Each of us know what that prescription is. Each of us know where we need that that extra measure of Christ in our lives right now. Whatever it is you're up against. Whatever's going on to drag you back to the sin you used to be in, that comfort zone. 
His desire is for you to flourish. He's interested in you being restored and growing. Psalms 92 says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree that will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Again, he has our best interests at heart. But can you say that today, knowing full and well that he is going to make you stronger, make you flourish, and who you were to be? And I'll leave you with this. Finally comes joy. 1 Peter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have, to have, may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, perishes even though refined by the fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. We don't see Him. He's there. We know it. We proclaim it. But we go through times sometimes and we just don't want to acknowledge the fact that He's there, that He cares, that He's available, that He's with you because it's going to require change on our part because the pattern we developed is not easily broken. But I know that the God, of, the God of the universe, my God, is able to do those things. He's able to take you and shield you by His power. He's able to cause you to rejoice and to proclaim that He's God. He wants us to please Him. He also wants to show you who He is in our lives, not who we are in our own head, because that's where vir virtually it's coming from. We're kind of making our own image in, inside of us of who we are, and that's not working. So today I challenge you, let God be God. You be you and follow Him. Let the God of the universe move you, give you breath, give you life. Don't try to fool yourself into thinking you can get through it on your own or you have enough words or inspiration. You can listen to build up things on the radio. You can listen to enough preachers preach the Word of God that builds you up and gives you positives. Let that go. Just turn to Christ. And I'll say find more cowbell. It might sound crazy, but this man wasn't crazy. He made gold records. He knew what he was doing. So I'm telling you, look a little crazy and do the things that don't usually turn the world on, but it's good for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, your word is a haven in darkness. I just think about God as we open your scriptures and we just find a wealth of knowledge and information, not knowledge to puff up, but knowledge that will change our hearts, renew our minds, that we would be transformed. We would be transparent to your Holy Spirit. So God, right now, we ask that you would just work with each one of us in the area that we need the most. Lord, whatever it be that so easily besets us and causes us to keep returning to that same place. God, I ask that you give us more strength, more power, more intellect, more of a heart towards you to know that you're there at all those times. And not to turn in those directions, left or right, but to look full in your wonderful face and head forward. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.